Hello everyone, I'm David and uh, we're doing something today uh, for the Australian Student Christian Movement. Just want to introduce you to everybody. Uh, Rachel. Hello. And Manny. Hi there, how are you doing? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Manny? Sure, uh, I'm a uh, Southern California, Los Angeles area radio broadcaster. Actually, my day job is that I report uh, traffic uh, on the news. And as you know, if you live in Los Angeles and all, that's never going to go away. We're the busiest city in, in the country. And so I report traffic on the weekends. I also a, a professor at three different uh, colleges in Southern California, a Rio Hondo College in Whittier and Mount San Antonio College in Walnut, California, which is right near uh, uh, Pomona, and then Fullerton College in Orange County. Excellent. Now, before we officially start, we have a tradition in Australia where we acknowledge our Indigenous um, elders, past, present, and emerging. And of course, because we're talking about film, and you're from the United States, also I want to reference uh, Native Americans, and of course, reference Indigenous people in films, or the lack of representation in, in, in some cases uh, in films. Now, we're doing this because of a project that Rachel is working on. Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about the project? The project is that I'm researching the representation of religion in film, like from the silent era to now, and like how, like what's, like the the films themselves, like how, like the how religion is depicted, but also in reference to like what's happening, what was happening in society at the time as well. Excellent, thank you for that. So we thought what we would do is find the film expert in the world, the best film expert uh, in the world, which is Manny, to go through some of the films that depict religion or something related to religion. So if we can start with It's a Wonderful Life, Manny, can you tell us a little bit about that film, which, of course, for those who haven't seen it, has an angel as one of the characters? Well, I can, I can say a couple of things, but first, let me just tell you from a personal point of view that during the pandemic, uh, we, I was involved with a project uh, that really was a bucket list project for me. I, I got to be in a radio play. As you remember, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, radio plays were really, really big until television came around and it kind of uh, set that aside. Well, they brought back a radio play, uh, a group out of Pennsylvania, because they couldn't perform on stage, and they reached out to a national voice audience, a voiceover audience, uh, actors uh, uh, that, that do voice, and I was hired to be in It's a Wonderful Life, the radio play, and I got to be uh, Clarence the Angel. So I got to play the angel, actually, and that was kind of cool. But uh, It's a Wonderful Life is, is a great story. It's become a Christmas classic here in the States. That is to say that every Christmas uh, it airs, because it does have the themes about uh, the idea of what Christmas means, the, the idea of fellowship and um, making sure that every life is precious, uh, including the life of Jesus when he was born. And that's how we celebrate Christmas if you're a Catholic, uh, primarily. But, but Christmas is celebrated uh, by all Christians. And um, It's a Wonderful Life handles all of those um, all of those ideas and notions. But I have to say that It's a Wonderful Life was part of a 1940s, an entire decade of filmmaking that dealt with the fantasy of talking with angels, God, the devil in human form. And they were very popular in the 1940s. And I can list you a number of those films that dealt very lightheartedly sentimentally and in some cases very harshly if you'd like i'll i'll mention who they what they are and what 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 became of those films yes, absolutely well the the first of those films was uh, uh in 1941 it was called here comes mr jordan and basically it dealt with the idea of a man whose life is taken too soon an angel inadvertently grabs the wrong person before he's supposed to die and now um, the headman, played by Claude Rains, you think he's God. I mean, I guess that's the notion that he's God. He's going to help him find another body so he can re live the rest of his life. And it's it's a wonderful film with uh, with Claude Rains and uh, Robert Montgomery, the um, <laughs> ironically the the father of Elizabeth Montgomery, who played a witch and and of course the TV show Bewitched. It's just a fabulous comedy. 
And uh, that set in motion these fantasy stories. And it was followed up with a, a World War II drama with Spencer Tracy and Irene Dunn called A Guy Named Joe. Again, a man dies, the angel plucks, his, uh, plucks him. He goes to see the head general. Of course, that's kind of the uh, metaphor for God. And he's sent back to help be a guardian for the soldiers fighting access aggression. And in this particular case, uh, Van Johnson. <laughs> so, so again, he plays an angel himself after he dies, and he watches over uh, the troops as they as they fight the Nazis. And uh, other films, uh, one of note that I do have to mention, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is based on an Oscar Wilde uh, a novelette. And, and basically, this tackles the idea when you make that Faustian bargain with the devil, that you can live for as long as you want, and you can let another object collect all of your sins in this case it's a it's a picture a portrait that collects all of his sins and then when when that uh, portrait is destroyed he dies so as you can see just as there's a number of these that led up to it's a wonderful life which is another idea of an angel coming down to show what it means and what it stands for to have um your life taken away by suicide and who who it affects who who are you going to affect and it even goes back to the notion of what happens had you had never been born. And that really, really uh, tells how important a life is throughout your entire uh, 50 or 60 or 70 years. And then it, that was followed uh, after that with another fantasy film, uh, just a great one, The Bishop's Wife, with uh, David Niven and Cary Grant and uh, Loretta Young. And basically, uh, a, a priest has gone astray, is more concerned about building a church than helping souls. So Dudley, the angel play, played by a Cary Grant, comes down to kind of set things right. And it's just it's just a real heartwarming, again, another holiday Christmas classic. As you can see, there's just a number of these. And I can go on and on with all of these. A Matter of Life and Death, another film with David Niven, which was a Michael Powell-directed British film that was just absolutely fabulous about a man who contemplates his entire life right before his plane is about to crash and he is about to die. And then, of course, there's a portrait of Jenny with uh, Joseph Cotton, uh, about a woman who just never ages. And, and he wonders why she always looks so good because maybe she's an angel. And I mean, these, this list just goes on and on. And then one of my other favorites, if I could just indulge with one yeah, more, The Devil and Daniel Webster. This is a really funny story about a uh, an individual, an honest far farmer who accidentally makes a bargain with the devil. So it is up to a court of evil people to decide whether this gentleman is going to go to hell. And to represent him is the great orator, Daniel Webster. And so Daniel Webster, played by a great character actor, Edward Arnold, along with um, the devil, Walter Houston, they, they tackle back and forth this courtroom case. And what not to be a spoiler, but what ends up happening is the man is allowed to live on his life, but Daniel Webster has to make the bargain that he can never run for president Again, because he runs for president a number of times. Well, in real life, he did run for president and he lost every time. So it kind of follows his real life history. So these are remarkable, fun fantasy films that all have religious themes to them. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll hear a little bit more about The Bishop's Wife uh, later on. But can you tell us, with It's a Wonderful Light, some of the behind the scenes story about James Stewart, Frank Capra? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Well, Frank, Frank Capra had a, a great relationship with James Stewart and uh, Gary Cooper was another one of his favorite individuals he loved to make films with. But particularly with James Stewart, this, this came at a really interesting time in his life. He had just gotten back from combat. Uh, I don't know if you know that James Stewart is our most decorated actor in history. No, I didn't know that. I, I don't count Audie Murphy because he wasn't an actor when he when he went into service. He only became an actor after. James Stewart left Hollywood and he ended up fighting in bomber pilot, uh, as a bomber pilot and, and, and rose to the rank of brigadier general. But he came back with a certain amount of PTSD. Uh, and, and he was a different man 
than he was prior to going to war. So he needed a project like this that helped him reassess the values of what life is all about. And his career changed because of his PTSD. He started making more edgy films, mostly in Westerns. But in It's a Wonderful Life, Frank Capra was able to use that edginess to really capture all of the frustration uh, you know, played by his character. And, and of course, his wife could not have been a better casting choice than Donna Reed. Donna Reed is absolutely a remarkable uh, maternal figure in this whole piece. And then they surround, Frank Capra was smart enough to surround the cast with some of the most iconic character actors in history. Lionel Barrymore playing the villain, Mr. Potter. Uh, uh, Uncle uh, uh, Billy played by Thomas Mitchell, who had a huge career and particularly in 1939 made some of the most iconic films ever. Uh, Gloria Graham, who went on to uh, to make a lot of film noir classics. And of course, Ward Bond, who was in over 300 films. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on. And Beulah Bondi, who played uh, Jimmy Stewart's mom uh, in four different films, culminating with this fourth film, It's a Wonderful Life. And one other thing, this film was made on set in Hollywood, even though it takes place across the country. It it's it was made in the middle of July and August during the, one of these horrible heat struck heat waves that we had, and they had to all bundle up in coats and scarves and hats. And it was it was rough making this film in the middle of summer, as you, and it was never really considered a Christmas film, but it was considered a winter film. So, now Rachel, to put you on the spot, have you seen It's a Wonderful Life? Oh, oh. I, I haven't. <gasps> Well, that's that's not good. Well, we gotta like get that. you to see this. Absolutely, you have to see this, Rachel, because it's it's a wonderful movie. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Manny, you you do like the film? It's something you you really like? Oh, it's one of my all time favorites. It's it, it, it you know the problem with it is it wasn't a hit when it when it was released and it, it was considered one of Frank Capra's lesser films. But that was the year of the best years of our lives about what it's like for vets to return home. Uh, from war and it, uh, just a remarkable Samuel Golden production with uh, with uh, Frederick March and uh, Dana Andrews and Myrna Loy and Virginia Mayo and it, that that was the film that was going to win everything. But um, I, I'm more interested in, in how how Rachel has missed this this fabulous movie. This is something that you're going to have to research because it's it's available for you to see and I think it's it's a great film. So Rachel, the uh, answer to that question: How have you missed this ride classic? <laughs> Uh, well, I I did do I obviously did some research before the interview, so yeah, like I knew know like what it's about. And Manny with James Stewart, like he's one of my favourite actors of all time. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's never been a scandal. We've never ever heard anything bad about him. No, no scandal at all. He 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 found the love of his life. He he married her, and they stayed married until she passed away. Um, he was never involved with a lot of women. He was a bachelor and a very good friend uh, to Henry Fonda. In fact, they were roommates for a short time prior to both of them making it big. About the biggest scandal you can make, and this is hardly a scandal, is that he probably should have won the Academy Award in 1939 for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And if he didn't win, it should have been Clark Gable and Gone with the Win, but instead Robert Denae won for uh, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. But because of that, here's the scandal part of it. The next year, the Academy decided to award him an Oscar for his performance in The Philadelphia Story. Now, don't get me wrong. The Philadelphia Story is a great film. But really, The Grapes of Wrath and Henry Fonda, he should have won. And that was that was always kind of stuck in the craw with, with James Stewart, that he, he accidentally took the award away from a very deserving Henry Fonda. And that's about the worst thing you can say about James Stewart. That's a pretty pristine life. That's right, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about Frank Capra? Frank Capra was uh, a very interesting man. He believed in great, what we call here in the States, uh, Midwestern values that people should involve themselves in uh, in family and friendship and devotion and faith in the common man. And the, the, the enemy could be politics and greed. And uh, he was there to tackle these, um, these notions 
in a variety of films. Mr. Deed Goes to Town, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Meet John Doe. Um, it Happened One Night, which is just a fabulous film uh, that uh, won every major award. Uh, and it set a record until Silence of the Lambs for winning the best picture, the best actor, the best actress, the best director, the best writer. So uh, Frank Capra was a very storied um, um, director. And then went to war with some of the other great directors like um William Wyler and um and uh, uh John Ford and uh, George Stevens and they made a variety of documentaries that are really propaganda films to raise money for war bonds and to show what the allies were doing against Hitler and uh, and against Japan and these films were mostly propaganda features that were really authored by the president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And uh, he, he came back even more patriotic. And right when he comes back along with James Stewart, they make It's a Wonderful Life. Thanks for sharing that. Our next film, The Robe. Can you tell us a little bit about The Robe? Well, The Robe was part of, <laughs> there's really a big backstory about films like The Robe and Ivanhoe and eventually the Ten Commandments, but let's, let's just stick with the robe. It's a movie starring, of course, uh, Richard Burton. And it's it's basically a, a, a series of films where the average individual has an encounter with, with Christ. And uh, it has to do with the robe of Christ and and, and what, what it symbolizes. And of course, Ben-Hur is one of those kinds of films as well. But it was a, it, it was one of those big blockbuster films that movie studios wanted to start making because they were horribly afraid that people were staying home because of television. They hated television. They didn't want to have anything to do with the actors, the producers, the 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 tele the telewriters. They wanted to get as far away from television as they could. And so what they started doing, they started making what they called epics, big films in big, bold color. And they did it in sense around, in cinema, cinerama and, and Vista Vision and Technicolor. And this was just a response to try to get away and get people to not stay home and, and go to the movies. And The Robe was part of these great epics because really, if you think about it, The Robe was a great little religious story but the Bible stories are great stories that are told in a very intimate fashion that really tackles the individual's faith. So the fact that the movie producers and directors were making these big blockbuster epics turns the Bible into something uh, almost heroic. It, it's it's this it's this massive book but it but the problem is when you do things bigger like that it makes things look more fantastic and and it, it, you know it makes it more like it's fantasy and and that's you know for for religious folks that's that people have to reckon with that mm -hmm. so the robe was one of those one of those uh, films and it really set in motion the career of richard burton um he had he had just come on the scene he's from wales he was coming along with a lot of great British uh, actors uh, of the day that were going to follow in his footsteps as well, or maybe the, he was following in, in their footsteps. People like Robert Newton was a, a great example of somebody, you know, these hard drinking, hard playing, stay up all night kind of English or Welsh or Irish folks. And then they were followed by people like Richard Harris and Peter O'Toole. Do you like the movie The Road? It's not one of my favorite movies, but, you know, when I do sit down to watch it, I don't change the dial. <laughs> but I mean, I've never seen it on the big screen. That would be something to see on the big screen because I'd like to see what the director had in mind. And that's, you know, the beauty and the curse of Turner Classic Movies here in the States is that you get to see films you might not have had a chance to see on the big screen. But it's hard to say, you know, how fantastic it looks, the robe or... or um you know, Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments, if you haven't seen it, I've seen the Ten Commandments on the big screen. I've never seen the robe on the big screen. And, you know, 1953 was a was a really important year because that is when the movie studios finally relented with um, Hollywood and just started partnering with them. You know, there was, a lot of things happened in television 
that made it so popular that the, the movies the movie studios couldn't ignore it anymore uh some of the things that happened just so you know um i love lucy came on the scene became a massive hit the dodgers were beaten by the giants in a climatic uh, uh contest uh, that led the winning giants to the world series in 1951 the army mccarthy hearings were where actors were and, and others were being called communists the coronation of elizabeth ii I mean, these were all massively big, big things. And then our our own war hero, Dwight D. Eisenhower, runs for president. And that election becomes um, just a, such a big, big deal. Television became important at that point. And so, you know, the, 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 the studios made large epics like The Robe at their own peril. Because you make a blockbuster and it fails the studio could go under. And that's exactly what happened to 20th Century Fox after the making of Cleopatra in 1963. It was a flop. They never recouped the money. And all of a sudden, 20th Century uh, Fox becomes a shadow of its former self. Now you've mentioned it uh, already, but can you mention Ben-Hur? Yeah, Ben-Hur is one of the most celebrated films of all time. I mean, it won, I, I, I believe, 10 Academy Awards. Uh, solidified the A-list actor that is Charlton Heston, who, to me, always overacted. So he fit very well in a big film, because if you're going to overact, you overact in a big film where it doesn't seem like it's so much. It's a long film. It's hard to watch. And it's become an Easter classic to watch here in the States. And they they will show it here and it's set in motion. It was part of a number of films that highlight or reference uh, the life of Jesus Christ. It was one, of course, the Ten Commandments was before that. That's the Old Testament. But when you're when you're talking about the life of Jesus Christ, that's set in motion, the greatest story ever told. Um, I mean, and other other films like that, the Bible, Barabbas. I mean, these were all films that wanted to replicate the success. Of Ben Hur, they they never did, but Ben Hur is is considered an absolute masterpiece of filmmaking, and uh, it really set in motion the, the 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 career of Charlton Heston. I mean, I don't I I don't know that Charlton Heston would have sustained as long a career had it not been for Ben Hur. He wins the Oscar for for best actor. And and deservedly so. I mean, he really does uh, offer a tour de force. But, you know, he was quite good also in, in the Ten Commandments playing Moses. I mean, but the problem with Moses, it's very Hollywood. Uh, the, the dialogue is not very religious sounding. It's not very reverential. It sounds like Hollywood. You know, when you're when you're putting actors like Edward G. Robinson and John Carradine and Yvonne DiCarlo, who are very showy kinds of actors. And it, it, it's fun to watch the Ten Commandments. But I never get the feeling it's a religious movie the way it should be. And that's that was the fault of the director, Cecil B. DeMille. Now, Ben-Hur is very reverential. Uh, they tackle the issues of the day, in, including late in the film, when they ta tackle the, the way people were treated with leprosy, uh, which was, of course, a big, big deal, you know, back in, in those days and even up until as late as the 19th century. So, I mean, how people looked at religion how people looked at prophets, how the apostles were treated. I mean, this all something that, that becomes real important. And all we have as reference is the Bible to be able to tell the stories. Well, to bring it to life as big as Ben-Hur does, and of course, then of course, the, I, I buried the lead, then there's the chariot scene. <laughs> I mean, that that is considered one of the great scenes in, of all time in filmmaking. And remember that Ben-Hur was also a remake from uh, from the silent era, and they had a great chariot scene as well. I didn't realize it was a remake. I knew to Ten Commandments was a remake. I didn't yeah. realize Ben-Hur was also a remake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Charlton Heston himself, can you talk a little bit about him or some of his other films, like Planet of the Apes? Well, yeah, he was real big in Planet of the Apes. He also got, d dabbled into the, uh, you know, these these movies about, tr you know, uh, tragedy, you know, these big disaster films. He was in Earthquake. Um, he played a, in a number of Westerns as well. He really had a very, and, you know, he, he also did Soylent Green, which is about, you know, how, how what happens to people when they reach a certain age. They, they get, they get uh, killed 
and then they get uh, eaten as as part of part of the chain of life of food, which is really really a scary prospect. But anyway, it's very depressing. Thanks for that. Yeah, Ed, it was Edward G. Robinson's last film. But anyway, uh, Charlton Heston makes these wonderful films after Ben Hur. He he stayed away from the religious films after that. And he started just doing a lot of different things. And I and I have to tell you, even though I, I think he's kind of a showy actor, kind of over the top, I did get a chance to see him perform at the Henry Fonda Theater. And he did uh, the play. It, it wasn't a musical of any kind. It was just a play of the Kane Mutiny Court Martial, where he plays the Humphrey Bogart character. And remarkably, I think it's one of the best performances I've ever seen on stage. He was absolutely magnificent now unfortunately an early supporter of john kennedy unfortunately he um became very rabid in his intention to support the second amendment here in the united states and he got very political became the president of the nra and um basically got known for like just one thing and and it's unfortunate that he gets known for this basically you're gonna have to tear a gun from my cold dead hands and it just it just shows you how showy he could be so <laughs> thanks for sharing that rachel do you know any child and heston films planet of the apes earthquake oh yeah planet of the apes yeah did you like it uh, yeah it was all right yeah uh oh, oh, oh that could be a no lady you gotta love those monkey outfits played by very famous people. Roddy McDowell uh, was one of the uh, actors. It's a it's a fun movie. It's if you like science fiction, you can't go you can't go wrong with the series of Planet of the Apes. What did you think of the remakes of Planet of the Apes? Uh, I like. I thought that the remakes started good, but then became not as good as they went on. Maybe. Isn't that the way it works? The first ones usually do well, and then not as good after that. Well, I thought I agree. I got to see one of the newer planet of the apes and i felt that um they did a very serviceable job but you really you really get the the stories are good and and the gentleman i, I don't his name escapes me but the gentleman who plays the main ape uh is real good andy actor. circus yes andy circus absolutely thank you now here's the expert right here that's Rachel. right now she's showing you up <laughs> thank you for being here for that because i would have been just lost but andy circus quite good really good that he can act so well and still have all that makeup and all of the costuming on really really wonderful job now can you tell us about a christmas carol now i sort of focused on the one from the 30s but really any version will, will be fine because obviously for those who haven't seen it there's quite a lot of references to how we live our lives the afterlife right. well it's it's charles dickens and of course dickens uh, had a lot of social commentary in most of his writings oliver twist for example uh, has to deal with you know poverty that was running rampant in England in the 19th century, and a Christmas Carol's a little bit of that as well. Now you referenced the 1938 version, which happens to be my favorite, but it, in a recent poll that was taken, there most people think the definitive classic is the 1951 Reginald Owen version. I I happen to like the Alistair Sim version. I just think it's really wonderfully done. I I think that Leo G. Carroll's ghost Marley, his his uh his um business partner who is now dead, of of suspic for suspicious reasons I might add, uh, Leo G. Carroll was one of the great character actors, and um, the man who plays uh, Bob Cratchit is another one of these great character actors who made hundreds of films, Gene Lockhart, and he's part of a a family of actors his his um daughter was in the film as well and uh playing one of his children and and she's june lockhart who of course we knew from lassie and from lost in space and and she's still with us she's 90 something like 95 or 96 and still with us so it, it's it's i think that the 1930s version for what they have and the, the special effects of the day do a really remarkable job and and i thought alistair sim was just the perfect Ebenezer Scrooge and that's basically what I grew up on I, I've seen the 51 clock don't get me wrong it is a remarkable film but for my money I, I'll go with you David I'm going to go with that 38 classic and it really set in motion uh, the making of more Christmas films I think that that's the film that does it I don't think that there was a film before that that you can say, oh, that's a definitive Christmas film. I think it starts with A Christmas Carol in 1938, 
And then it continues on. And that's when you start getting stuff like Miracle on 34th Street, The Bishop's Wife, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, all of these Christmas films come way later, but it's it starts with the 1938 film, A Christmas Carol, I think. Excellent. Now, Rachel has some films for you, too. Oh, my. Oh, actually, first, I, I just thought of this then. At last, I don't know if either of you saw the, the I guess, remake of, like, the, it's, well, not a remake, but kind of, like, take off of A Christmas Carol that was just released, I think, last year, Spirited, where it's, it has yeah. the it has some of the characters from a Christmas Carol, but it's kind of like a like modern reimagining sequel. And actually, My that one like it's obviously in the holiday period, but they actually very rarely reference Christmas in that movie. Yes, I, and Christmas you know the problem with today's today's kind of reimagining is that they concentrate more on special effects in the story. I think that's the problem with Hollywood historians today, they want to see more of those story laden. They want character development. They want good, crisp writing. Special effects are great, but it shouldn't start with special effects. I think special effects should be the icing on the cake and it's become the cake. <laughs> if that makes any sense. So, Indeed. Rachel? Oh, well, the first of the movies is Going My Way. What, what are yes. your thoughts? Going My Way. That's a great classic film that won just about everything in 1944 Bing Crosby Barry Fitzgerald let me speak a little bit about what religion how it was depicted before films made by Spencer Tracy uh, who played a priest in in several films um, the boys town San Francisco men of boys town the devil at four o'clock but Bing Crosby also did the bells of St. Mary going my way before they played priests Religion was depicted as zealotry, that the, the, the characters that were played usually were hardliners, were scary, were very uh, villainous in some cases, were fakes or phonies. And then comes along the warm-hearted Spencer Tracy and the equally warm-hearted Bing Crosby in these series of just wonderful, family-friendly religious friendly films and they basically put religion on their ear and they allowed families to enjoy religion in movies again and going my way is probably if boys town i think goes with it but boys town and, and, and going my way are remarkably uh the best example of how religion is focused on in, in black and white movies of the 1940s bing crosby can sing a little bit <laughs> Of course, in real life, he could sing a lot. He had a big hit, you know, he had big hits, a lot of hits. But um, but he's allowed to uh, show what it's like uh, to to preach the gospel in in kind, in friendly ways. He's got a superior uh, in Barry Fitzgerald, who's a little bit more of the old school version of what religion should be about. But again, he's very warm hearted, very friendly. They have a friend played by the reliable comedian uh, Frank McHugh, who plays a priest. And in the hands of Leo McCary, who is very well known for doing comedies of the silent era, as well as the screwball comedies of the 30s, Leo McCary was able to keep this very lighthearted very fun to watch. And once it won all the awards, they had to go back in and do The Bells of St. Mary as a remake because it was such a popular film. And as a matter of fact, the next time you watch, or, or in Rachel's case, the first time you watch It's a Wonderful Life, when Jimmy Stewart, is, as George Bailey, is running down the street saying, hello, old Bijou Theater, the movie they're showing on that Bijou Theater is... The Bells of St. Mary, which is the remake of Going My Way. <laughs> and we were talking about Christmas before, and of course, Bing Crosby, one of his famous uh, songs, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. Well, yes, but Irving Berlin actually wrote that song for Fre Fred Astaire. And Fred Astaire is not known as a singer. He can sing a little, but he's really not a crooner. And so he passed it along to his friend, Bing Crosby, and Bing promptly said, oh, no, 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 I hate this song. It's too corny. I don't want to sing this song. But, you know, he listened to his friend, Fred, and Mr. Astaire talked him into it. And to, the, to date, it is the biggest selling Christmas record of all time. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> the next film, Rachel? 
Oh, the, oh, the next film, Samson and Delilah. Yeah, ah, it's it's one of those great Bible stories again. That's that's set up in this big big epic, and this was at the start of the epic filmmaking. Um, I'm not as familiar with this film. I've seen it once, but it, I probably saw it in my childhood. But it really did steady the career of Victor Mature, who was a film noir heavy, uh, liked to play the, the 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 good guy bad guy type. You know, in film noir, the good guys were bad guys as well. You know, they were very nuanced that way. Always kind of ended up with a, a femme fatale and they may die at the end. I mean, that that could happen. Well, if you want to pick a Bible uh, film noir epic, that would be Samson and Delilah. You know, he, he plays this heroic type that once the hair gets cut off, you know, he becomes a, a weak, a weak hero. And uh, so he's kind of troubled by a femme fatale, if you want to use that reference or that metaphor. Samson and Delilah was a hit. It was a big, it was a big movie. And it's, it's the one, probably that, um, I want to say, uh, is, if you want to talk about uh, historical films, Captain of Castile was another, were the ones that set in motion the epic films of the 1950s. It, that was, that was the start of the, uh, of the epic films with Samson and Delilah, Captain of Castile. Uh, and these were, these were the ones that were big and bold and uh, an answer to the small screen of television, and they set in motion the films of the 1950s. Rachel, what's your favorite classic film? Has Manny mentioned any of them? Uh, uh, oh, that, that would be hard to say. Yes. I don't, well, I don't know. I would have to think too long. <laughs> one that you like? Maybe one that you like a lot? That you'd, you'd go one of see. your favorites. That's right. One of your favorites. Oh, I don't know. We, uh, we watched... I can't remember what there was this one I watched recently. I can't remember what it's called, but it was Beware. Or it was was it a monster? Movie? Was yeah. it a monster? Oh no! It was one where it was like this guy came to this like town, and then there was something with a clock tower where there was a whole thing there, and yeah, it was. I, I'm I'm not explaining this well. Sorry. That's all right. A man, a town, a clock tower. I thought Back to the well, Future. That's, that's, that's no, no, a lot Back to the Future. It was. It was it's uh, that well that Back to the Future. But I was thinking an old black and white. It could have been the Stranger. It, yeah, yeah, but yeah, the Stranger. That was it. Yeah. Well, you said clock tower. Orson so Welles. Orson Welles and, Wells. Wells. Yeah. Yeah. Wells and Edward yeah. G. Robinson. It's a great film noir. Yeah, he plays a Nazi, and he ends up dying on the clock tower. So yeah, <laughs> when you said the clock tower, I knew what it was. I knew it was the Stranger. Yeah, yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought it was called, yeah, I thought it was called that, but I didn't want to say the wrong name. And, no, that's yeah. all right. You can say the wrong name. Well, the, the, the wife is played by Loretta Young, who plays the wife in The Bishop's Wife. So, oh. okay. so yeah, yeah. You, you see all these ties. They keep popping up. Uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson, of course, was in, in, uh, uh, um, uh, in The Ten Commandments, for example. So, I mean, these names do pop up over and over and over again. You Ooh. like The Stranger. Good for you. That is a really... That's not one of that that most people would pick, but you know that that just tells you that you kind of deep you kind of went deep in the weeds for for a good film. That's good. That's a good thing. The next film, Rachel. Uh, the next film. Well, the next one is The Bishop's Wife, actually. Well, The Bishop's Wife is just a delightful film uh, with lots of um, whimsy, and here's a great example of how casting changes everything originally david niven was going to play dudley the angel and cary grant was going to play the bishop and cary begged off and said make can i play can i play dudley i'd like to play the but and and he was told but that's not the that you're not the you're not the the the, the love scene you're not the the partner you're 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 just the angel he goes, I, I think it's a more interesting role. And he decided that he would do that. And he and because of that change, it became one of Cary Grant's signature films. It set in motion um, David Niven into starring roles. In, in that film, he takes third billing. And in, throughout his career, he would play the third build or the fourth build or the fifth build actor. Well, after The Bishop's Wife, he went on to star in a number of films like Around the World in 80 Days, and he wins an Oscar for Separate Tables. So he became a major star because of The Bishop's Wife and that switch. That switch really was what did it for David David Niven. And there's a 
some great character actors, uh, James Gleason, who also appeared in that movie we talked about way back when, um, uh, Here Comes Mr. Jordan, and he plays a cab driver, and also Monty Woolley, who was a great friend of Cole Porter, good, good actor, Real, he could play really snarky roles, and in this one he's real snarky, who doesn't believe in religion, and by the end of the film, he he, be, he softens and decides to go to church. And so he, he hasn't changed, but he's opened his mind to the ideas of religion. And Monty Woolley was the perfect uh, character to play this part. Now, Monty Woolley, in my books, I've written a series of books. In my last book, Road to Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, Monty Woolley, along with Gene Lockhart, who was in The Christmas Carol, the two of them combined played in more Christmas films than any actor, and that includes Bing Crosby. Um, Gene Lockhart, of course, was in uh, A Christmas Carol, was also in um, Miracle on 34th Street. But, you know, Marty Woolley also was in a great, uh, what is now an up-and-coming Christmas classic called The Man Who Came to Dinner. And he comes to dinner right around Christmas time. <laughs> so so Marty Woolley got to play in a number of these Christmas classics. And uh, it got to be known for, you know, playing in, in, in movies having to do with the holidays. And so he he's a fun he's a fun actor and um, didn't make he made way too few movies. I think he made only about a dozen movies, but, but he was good in every single movie he made. But it's really Cary Grant's movie as Dudley. He really gets to showcase all of the special effects of the day. There's one scene where he actually decorates the tree and he does it in his own magical, really spectacular way. And. The hired help played by the lovely and wonderful, delightful Elsa Lancaster, who was married to uh, Charles Lawton. Uh, she's remarkable. Oh, and one more thing. The the young girl, the, the little child in The Bishop's Wife didn't make a lot of films, but she's also known for playing Zuzu in It's a Wonderful Life. So that little child, who, by the way, is still alive, made The Bishop, Bishop's Wife and it's a wonderful life. So there you go. One more connection. Um, Rachel, do you have any other films on the list? Um, going my way. We just talked about that. That no. one we have. Yeah. Right. There was right. One, one more. I think we have one more, which was, I've got to remember the name. Oh, of sorry, it. sorry. Oh, I that's read right. the wrong. That's right. Heaven, go ahead. Heaven Can Wait. Yeah. Heaven Can Wait is one of those fantasy films again. Um, are you in the 1940s? Now there was a more modern version of a of a film called Heaven Can Wait in the 1970s. I'm not sure which one you're referencing, but I will tell you if it's a 1970s version, it is actually the remake of Here Comes Mr. Jordan. And as a matter of fact, James Mason plays the character Mr. Jordan. So I mean, it is absolutely a remake. And it's great that you, if, if it's the 19th, it, it's, it was a film that was made for uh, Julie Christie and its star, Warren Beatty. And James Mason, of course, plays Mr. Jordan, who's just the perfect counterpoint to, to uh, Claude Rains. And it, it really helped the careers of, uh, for example, Charles Grodin, who became a great character actor into the 90s. And um, it's, it's just a really fun really fun film is it, they make it more of a comedy in the 1970s than they did in the 1940s uh but it really uh was paying homage to those great fantasy films of the 40s i really do recommend to your viewers that if you get a chance and you want to see a genre a set of films i mean it's easy to pick film noir in the 1940s it's easy to pick screwball comedies of the 1930s it's easy to pick pre-code of the late 20s into the 30s but I really do recommend those fantasy films of the 1940s. People don't talk about them enough. And, they're, and many of them are religious themed. But, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a really positive thing because it's able to look at the frailties of humanity. And we get to get a little peek, albeit it's the director's point of view and the writer's point of view. We get to see a little peek of how god and angels look upon us when we're making our mistakes when we're weak when we do things right i think that's that's kind of a an interesting thing to contemplate as humans what what would god say what would an angel say if we were doing this or that or the other thing 
And these films allow us to take a peek at that. And I think that that's okay. I think that that's, that makes life really interesting. Do you like the original version? The sort of the non-comedy one? Uh, well, it's it's still funny. It's just a mildly funny film as mm -hmm. opposed to an uproarious funny film. Mm -hmm. In that film, he uh, uh, Robert Montgomery wants to go back into boxing and win the uh, heavyweight crown. In the Warren Beatty film, uh, Heaven Can Wait, he, he wants to play for the Rams. Now, I'm from Los Angeles, and I'm a big Rams fan, so I always kind of liked the film because he was supporting my team. But uh, that's – so it, the, the sport changes, and, of course, it's in color versus black and white, and it's Robert Montgomery versus Warren Beatty. But, yes, all in all, I think it's a charming film, and I think it holds up really well just like the original but, you know, I'm always a big fan of originals uh, when it comes to the golden age. Now, if it's a silent film that becomes a sound film, then I'm usually a big fan of the sound film. So that's how that works. Well, thanks for sharing that. Can I ask you about the production code? Because we're talking about films. And sure. can, can you talk a little bit about what the production code was and, and whether you thought it was a good idea or not? And it was actually backed by the Catholic Church uh, from what we yes, read. Yes, absolutely. Joseph, it, it, they, they called it the Hayes Code because that was the office. He, uh, uh, Will Hayes was the uh, head of the of the office that put out the production code. But truth be told, his uh, appointee named Joseph Breen, who was in bed with, metaphorically in bed, with the, uh, with the Catholic Church, who set in motion in 1934 um, a set of rules and guidelines because they were just the Catholic church and uh, other decency leagues were just up in arms about a number of things. And the first of which was the elimination of uh, prohibition. Once prohibition went away, even though that also hurt the gangsters, it, it really made the Catholic church feel like they didn't have a cause anymore. So they turned to Hollywood because Hollywood was making by that point, they had to they had to find a way to get people back into the seats because once the silent films went away, now they had to contend with sound. And in 1927, 28, 29, they hadn't figured out the sound thing right. So that means everything had to be staged as a play. In other words, you couldn't move around. You had a microphone in a in a potted plant or you had it somewhere that you couldn't be seen, but you couldn't move because if you moved away from the microphone, you couldn't be heard. Well, it took some director's ingenuity, uh, notably Raoul Walsh and William Wellman and uh, one other, um, well, the name escapes me for the moment. Oh, King Vidor, King Vidor. Um, they all learned uh, uh, learn how to move the microphone and, and they created the boom, the boom mic. And now they started making more exciting films. Well, by exciting, that meant films with sexual content where you might see very scant, scantily clad women in movies and adult themes. Women are now starting to uh, have sex out of wedlock. They're starting to not mention the word, but they actually tackle the subject of abortion. And and, and they make light of, of, the, of sex in comedies like from the Marx Brothers. But not only, not only just sexual innuendo, but also, they were also becoming more violent. This is the era of, you know, the, the public enemy, these gangsters and 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 uh, Scarface. And I mean, these great, very violent films that had never been seen before. And don't forget the monster movies that emerged during the, um, what we called the pre-code era. And that included Frankenstein and The Invisible Man and uh, King Kong. So all of these films were really, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically poking the eye of the Catholic Church. And so together with Ray Breen, um, they were able to set across a number of codes that basically changed the way films were going to be made as of uh, mid-1934. They, they had to be all run by a, a, a censor board. And if it didn't pass the board, you could not get a a page of like an okay that would be featured at the start of the film. And uh, if you didn't get that okay, that film cannot be released. It would not gonna be allowed to be released. But what changed, why I don't like the code and the code lasted by the way, from 1934 to 1967, that's a long time. 
here's all you need to know about how how quickly everything changed when the code was put in place. In 1933, the biggest box office star was Mae West. And any, if you know anything about Mae West, she poked fun at sex like nobody's business. She would do it in her look and she would do it in the things she said. The following year with the code in place, the biggest box office draw was Shirley Temple. <laughs> so everything had to be happy endings. If somebody commits a crime, they must pay. That's code. You must pay. If you kill somebody, you must die at the end. That's code. An eye for an eye, basically very biblical. But the idea was they weren't believable endings and films were sanitized. And that was not a good thing for the people who were making the films. Directors were frustrated. Actors were frustrated. Female actors were really frustrated because now they were kind of, you know, put in, in stereotypes as pure women and, and matronly and motherly women. And they weren't given any in interesting things to do in films, not until film noir comes along. But of course, then you get to have to pay the price at the end. So there was just no idea of uh, being able to rec you know, re rectify your sins. So in 1966, when the code's still in place, a very good movie, but very sanitized movie, A Man for All Seasons, wins the Academy Award for Best Picture. In 1967, when the code finally goes away, and now we have the motion picture codes, you know, uh, G, P, G, R, and uh, X, th those rating codes, all of a sudden, in six months, I, I, it was as if they knew the code was going away, you start getting films like The Graduate, which has adultery as its theme, Bonnie and Clyde, which is very violent, in the Heat of the Night, which deals with racial themes. And guess who's coming to dinner? Again, more racial, you know, what's it like for a black man to marry a white woman? These are films that would have never been approved just a year before. So the code just was, I think, a bit too sanitized. I mean, the code works in a musical because musicals are always sanitized. But even then, if you think of a musical prior to the code, like, um, the Music Man or My Fair Lady. And then you look at the films after the code, Cabaret, um, Sweet Charity, and then eventually films like Rent, where we have much more adult themes. Some of these films could not have been made during the code. And that's, that's just fact. Did the studios really push against it or did they kind of just accept that it was there and you know we complained at the start and then they just got on with it would they really try to get no the it? studios absolutely hated it at first because they were making gobs of money i mean they knew the audiences wanted to see sex and violence what do audiences want to see in the summertime today they want these big science fiction with lots of violence and sexual innuendo and they love these things I mean, they, they did not want to change, but they were forced to change. It became a political mandate for them to change. They had to comply or their films were just simply not going to get released. And if they don't get released, you've just spent a lot of money and getting no bang for your buck. And so the they public, were, were they like, did they really campaign against the code or was it more kind of acceptance? Like, we don't like it, but what are you going to do? The, they may not have liked it, but, you know, unfortunately, the public can be a little bit like sheep. They'll just go and watch whatever's put in front of them. And I don't think anybody really complained all that much. I mean, the code was in place for 30 years. The ones that were complaining were the actors. And what ended up happening, it started breaking up the uh, studios. Actors started making films on their own. If they didn't want to make a film that was under the code, they would go to Europe and make a European film after the war. So yeah, people like Ava Gardner spent most of her career making films in Europe because she didn't want to follow the code. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why you see these actors in some of these, um, in these European films, Italian films or French films, uh, Japanese films, because they wanted to get away from the code or actors would start their own uh, studios. Uh, Humphrey Bogart's a, a great example, started his own studio. 
Also, John Wayne started his own studio. Burt Lancaster started his own studio. United Artists would start taking up the fight against the code. And they would they would make their own independent films. United Artists, of course, was the studio that was created by um, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, uh, D.W. Griffith, and Douglas Fairbanks Sr. So they would they would fall under the banner of United Artists, and they would start making adult themed films. And that was you know each time they would make a film that was kind of adult themed, that would put a crack into the glass ceiling of the code. The real backbreaker, though, Psycho. Psycho was the film, six years before the code went away. Psycho had all of the elements of violence and sexual innuendo, and only a master like Alfred Hitchcock could get around the code. <laughs> and he did it. And he did it remarkably well. And that spelled the death knell of the code once Psycho was released. Have you seen Psycho, Rachel? Oh, no, I oh. haven't. <laughs> don't watch it alone, and don't watch it in the dead of night. You'll be scared. <laughs> And you mentioned before Manny, uh, Man for All Sneezes. Is that the Thomas More story? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great story. Paul Schofield, in pro I mean, with respect, with respect to um, To Kill a Mockingbird and, and Gregory Peck, I do believe that, that uh, Paul Schofield's Sir Thomas More may have had the performance of the decade. I, I, there are those going to argue with me and say, oh, no, 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 come on, really? to kill a mockingbird that atticus finch that was the performance you know but but i i happen to think that that paul schofield's performance was absolutely magnificent and that tackled religious issues the idea of whether or not the king could divorce so that he could marry his second wife and instead of allowing the pope to poo poo it what does henry the eighth do as 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 told by historians he started his own church <laughs> he says, I'm not going to listen to the Pope anymore. We are going to break away from Catholicism and we're going to start our own church. And that's really the theme of A Man for All Seasons, if you think about that. Magnificent film, by the way. Indeed. Uh, before we finish, Rachel, do you have any tough questions for Manny about Hollywood films? Uh, uh, actually, with all the questions, I was just going to say on the topic of the Hayes Code, with, like, I know a lot, like, I'd heard of it before and like a lot of it was like, quite marginalizing towards like different communities and even I don't I, when I was reading about all the different films that we were talking about before one thing I read to do with Samson and Delilah was this wasn't even enforced by the by the Hays Code I don't think but just because of all the anti-semitism in society like they were never like referred to as like the Israelites or anything in the movie oh, yeah. like just we were saying about like the like was their pushback against like the code well like they were doing that like they they did that even like without it being enforced by the code. Well, the, the remarkable film that, that dealt with anti-Semitism was Gentleman's Agreement. But even then, the actors had to pay for that. Uh, several of the actors, including famously John Garfield, who was in, in a Gentleman's Agreement, were attacked by um, Joseph McCarthy as being communists. If you are an anti-Semite, you probably are a communist as well. And and all you had to do was just look and see of whether or not they attended any kind of uh, meetings. And, you know, it was such hypocrisy because we had to partner with Stalin to defeat Hitler. You know, I mean, it was, it, it was just remarkable hypocrisy. But if you tackled a tough issue and you got by the Hays Code like anti-Semitism, then you might be punished in a different way. And that is just remarkably wrong in all kinds of ways but that's what that's what I, you know it's, it always amazes me that today you hear actors or you hear uh filmmakers or you hear the audience say well everything's more political today had they not heard of mccarthyism <laughs> had they not heard of the Hayes code i mean it, it was worse then i mean it's bad now but it was worse then now we're much more aware of it because we have a 24 hour news cycle that tackles it every day of the week for 24 hours at a time. Back then you had to wait for the morning newspaper. You had to wait for the evening newspaper. You had to wait for the evening newscasts. So it wasn't talked about round the clock. So the only difference is that we're talking about it round the clock today, but we've always had to deal with politics and religion in their decision making when it comes to um, being able to express your talents, so to speak, as writers, as directors, as actors, as any kind of filmmakers. 
So, uh, and, and even in television and, and in radio as well. So, I mean, and, and even in music, I mean, you, you look at the political nature of, of, of individuals like Woody Guthrie, who was, you know, very much would put in socialist overtones in his music. So, I mean, it's been a, it's been a tit for tat for a long time. And for those people who say, well, no, I don't, I don't, I don't watch the Oscars anymore. They're just too political. Well, that's code for people saying, I don't agree with these politics. Because when the when McCarthyism was going, that was your politics then. It's similar to today. And you agreed with that. So it has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with your politics. And that's the problem. There's always been politics on both sides in filmmaking. We just have to recognize it. That's all. Be, be, be adults about it and just recognize it and move on. Uh, Rachel, any final thoughts? Uh, I guess just about like, I guess like the like notable changes in like how like religion has been portrayed in the films because like you're saying about like how like the back then like versus now with politics like even like when we're talking about like you like like more like comedic religious films like even like now I like would be struggling to think of any that are getting made now because I feel like yeah there would be like such a pushback of like yeah. people saying yeah stuff about it so yeah well, I mean, in the 70s, we did have those very um, compelling, what we call horror films, like The Exorcist and The Omen, in which, you know, the priests were the heroes, but they were also the victims, because, you know, devil the devil can be a very dangerous foe, obviously. We knew who the villain was, but but dealing with the villain could be quite, uh, quite compelling. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, you referenced, Rachel, the um, the comedies like Sister Act. You know, with Whoopi Goldberg, or maybe um, I don't. I don't know that we have films being made about religion as much these days. I think that there's just been too much pushback about the way religion is looked at, and because of a 24-hour news cycle, any group can you know have now a sounding board to make and issue complaints, and that can actually. Um, railroad a film into a poor box office and who wants to make a film if it's going to be controversial and then all of it at the end of the day end up with with box office weak box office receipts so i mean what it does is it kind of sets up its own version of a haze code where people are afraid to make you know interesting films maybe about religion that's not to say we don't make interesting films it's just to say that maybe religious films have become a little bit more off the table than it has been maybe in the past. And Manny, do you have any final thoughts about Hollywood? I know that you guys are going through a strike. Oh, we got the writers. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something you're not going to feel uh, for a couple of years. You know, everybody talked about how COVID, oh, 2020 is just going to be horrible. Well, they had a bunch of films from 2018 in the can. Oh, well, then if 2020 is not, 2021 is going to be just off. No, we had films from 2019. The really, I think that the, where we really got hurt was last year. Last year's films did not really excite me in any way. I, I don't, I can't think of anything outside of maybe Tar. I liked Tar, but outside of Tar, really nothing really made me say, wow, what great filmmaking. And I think what's going to happen with this writer strike is you're going to see uh, television get weaker than it already is. Cable's already on its last leg. And I think you're going to see streaming services take the first hit they've ever taken because COVID was actually good for streaming services. I don't think that this strike is good for streaming services. I don't think that you're going to end up with good product come 2025 into 2026. I think that's where you're going to see the real issues. And, and these, um, these creative types are going to have to rush to try to put out content and it's it's kind of hard when you have more avenues you have what the netflix and you have uh amazon prime and you have hulu and you have disney plus and paramount plus and 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 hbo max and all of these these different uh groups that you have to put out content for so i think that the longer this strike goes on we're going to really see in a couple of years some very poor content and that's that's a shame for the audience and that's a shame for filmmakers and 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 uh, streaming content uh, of all types. And that's that's a scary proposition. Thank you to both of you for joining. It was lovely to uh, chat to both of you. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Nice to meet you, Rachel. Thank you. Yes, it was yeah, so interesting to hear you talk about 
all the movies and yeah.